All right, everyone. Welcome. Um, welcome to another in Esoterica live stream. Um, I have to say, I'm really pleased to be uh, joined by uh, by Father Aaron Leach, uh, a scholar and a practitioner of uh, the Western esoteric tradition, someone who I really, really respect both for his scholarship uh, and the way he, he he does his magical practice. It's You've probably seen us bantering back and forth in some of the comments, especially on episodes on Abramelin or the Enochiana stuff. Um, and we're both nerds about this, especially this John D. Enochiana stuff. And I have to say that... Uh, Aaron, you've done, in my opinion, a, a monumental task, especially when it comes to this uh, angelical language. Your two-volume work on the angelical language is, to my mind, absolutely the best um, analysis of what's going on in the D diaries about this whole business of this angelic speech. And I just, anyone who does that kind of work, and I've worked with the D ma ma manuscripts, I work with the D war, uh, the D text. I work with the Nokian stuff. It's a mess. <laughs> it is a Titanic mess, <laughs> and that you've worked through it. That I, the, the work you do in the in your uh, in Nokian dictionary, where you go straight through so much stuff, you compare things with Liber Loga. I mean, that's a task in its own, right? Just to have in your oh, yeah. mind all of forty eight hundred of these bizarre words at which we have vir virtually no translations. I just want to just say thank you for the work you've done uh, on the uh, on the Enochian stuff specifically, not counting all the other amazing scholarship you've done, the contributions you've made uh, to uh, people's spiritual practice in the Abramelin tradition and the Grimoire tradition and, and the, and, and, and the various traditions of Western esotericism. And it's just a great opportunity for me as someone who's just a, you know, civilian, just an academic um, to be able to sit across the table virtually from someone who's both a scholar and a practitioner and a teacher. And for us to be able to sit across from each other, meet where we can, disagree where we do, and respect each other and respect each other's work, I think that's just fantastic. And I just want to really thank you for coming on the show and uh, just really thank you for the scholarship you've done. So uh, welcome. Welcome, Aaron. Thank you. Wow. Thanks. That's the, that's awesome. Thank you so much. I'm, I'm really honored to be here. I'm you have to excuse me if I fanboy a little bit myself for, <laughs> for being on Esoterica. I mean, like, like, I mean, honestly, hands down, this is like the show on, you know, this is the, this is the channel on YouTube for, for uh, cultism and esotericism. It's, it's so easy to find channels that are just full of so much nonsense, you know, and I never, I never hesitate to share your videos to my students and my followers because it's always so meticulous and so informative. So, so I, I got to say thank you, you know, for, for what you offer to us because it's, it, it's frankly incredible. And, and I, I kind of stand in awe of it. So, well, it's, it's just, again, I think that this is a thing that I really mm -hmm. like about YouTube where, and I can do academics, academic stuff on the one hand, and I don't have to be sort of siloed in just academia. I can, I can reach out to anyone I damn well please. Um, and I can reach out to, you know, practitioners and practitioner scholars like yourself and, and bring you guys on. And we can spend an hour and change nerding out about Anokiana. So it's really, a, uh, it's a great thing about the not straight jacket that is YouTube as opposed to the straight yeah. jacket that is, that is academia. And I think also, I mean, sometimes I think the straight jacket that can also be the world of occult practice where having any opinion whatsoever makes you 50,000 people's enemies somehow. Um, yeah, yeah, I've, I've been I've, I've been down that road, so <laughs> I know how that is. Yeah, it's, it's, sometimes people have this this tendency to think that because you're advocating one way, that must mean that you are that you are antagonistic toward another way. And yeah, yeah, you know, people get a little miffed when they read into what you're saying. So, but you know, that's yeah, that's the internet. We're used to it by now. Social media. I mean, it's it's not just occultism. <laughs> yeah, no, right. No, right. And it's, uh, yeah, we, I think that, yeah, we could all, yeah, we could all benefit from a bit of like esoteric ecumenicalism, um, that, that, uh, you have your way and I have my way. And it's sometimes weird. Cause I often get like shade thrown at me in like the Twitter verse or the YouTube verse or whatever, uh, for not being a practitioner or like people like will become, mm -hmm. they'll get, dis they'll get disappointed that I'm not a practitioner. And I'm like, look, I'm, I never, said I was, I, I don't pretend to be, I, I never pretend to give anyone any spiritual advice. Uh, I, I, I always identify as just a civilian. I'm a, you know, just a, a lowly academic 
Um, and it's funny how people can, I don't know. I think people want, well, there's a, like, there's a place for the academic though. You know, it's, it's, you know, and what I do, I'm not an academic, you know, mm -hmm. and, and, and I know, and I understand, I hang around with enough academics to know what it means to be academically trained. Um, you know, research is not easy no. and, um, not just the method of research, but also having access to libraries and source materials that we out here in the plebe world don't have. So, you know, someone like me not being an academic, I, I look at you guys, you, you, you're so important because, you know, you were writing the books like, you know, like Penn State Press mm -hmm. writes the Magic and History series. And oh, my God, is it incredible? And it doesn't it matter if they're practitioners. They are teaching us the history. And that's what you're doing. You're teaching us the history. Right. And we... We have to know that history. There's there's such a there's such a trend today for making it all up as you go along. As long as it suits you, it's fine. And there's like no desire to be connected to the history, to the the, the practitioners that came before you. Right. you know, like like we say in the Golden Dawn, to become the next link in the chain of adepts passing down through history. You know, and so you guys are so important because you we wouldn't know that history without. The academia. I mean, if you leave occultists up to it, we're gonna have we're gonna talk about Atlantis and aliens. <laughs> and, I mean, you know what I'm saying? It just goes off the rails. So the academic material has to ground us. We have to mm -hmm. be grounded there, and then you apply the the, the practical experience with that material. So, right? right. Yeah, I I'm absolutely a, a big fan of what you do, even if you never pick it up and practice it. You know. Well, I hope that again. I hope that there can be. My, my hope always is there's a helpful synergy between what I do, what you do, what other occultists do, uh, what other academics that are on YouTube do, that we can build a community around, you know, around, again, like I said, a kind of esoteric ecumenicalism that we can, it's far better for us to stand together, especially in the wake of what will probably be another satanic panic, which I think we're already in the midst of another satanic panic. We are. Um, we are. Yeah, I, think, I think we are as well. And I think that uh, having been the victim of something like that, um, I, I want to be in a position where I stand with my occultist brothers and sisters and trans people and say, as an academic, I want nothing to do with, uh, um, with, with that. And I want to be part of, you know, standing with religious minorities, being a relig religious minority myself, that, uh, mm -hmm. I want to be in y'all's boat and not the, uh, the boat of the people who are the jackasses on the other side. So, Same here, brother. <laughs> yeah. Same here. Um, all right, folks. So what we're going to do, if it's, if it's okay with folks, and I know that, uh, you know, there's so many people, there's a lot of folks in the chat. There's some questions in the chat. I'm going to try to get to them. But what I want to do is um, I have a couple of questions that I want to pitch out to Aaron that I will maybe answer a little bit myself, um, because I think it's interesting to just to get some perspective from um, from an experienced practitioner like uh, like Father Leach. And, and, you know, I'll jump in with whatever ideas I have. And um and we'll kind of go from there. We'll do a couple of these things and then we'll come back in and get some questions from the chat. And um, again, I also want to say, uh, Aaron, I hope this is not our last time hanging out doing this. I really hope this is the, the first time and then there will be uh, more opportunities for us to do this in the future. And, and I hope so too. Yeah. So I think that, again, that's not, uh, we don't have to, uh, we're not going to finish it all tonight. I, I, I firmly believe that we're not going to answer all the questions about an Okiana in an hour and change. Um, so, Aaron, how did you get into this Anokian stuff? What, 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 what was your, what was your entry? When it, do you remember when you first, when you oh, first yeah. learned about John D and and uh, Anokiana? Well, uh, John D came later, but uh, I, I remember my very first encounter with with the Anokian system, and it was uh, I was in Denver which is where I went uh, after high school, basically. I spent some time up in Wyoming, but I pretty quickly moved down into Denver and I was associated down there with the Renaissance Festival. And especially in the 90s, that was wall-to-wall -wall neo pagans. So it was witches as far as the eye could see. So that's where, I, that's where my path really took off. You know, that's mm -hmm. where I started practicing magic, got a hold of Don Craig's book for the first time, that kind of thing, you know. Mm -hmm. And I was standing in an apartment with a friend in Denver, and he was, at least in our little group, we kind of considered him the more experienced of us. He was a little older than the rest of us and had been doing it longer and stuff. And um, he picked up a book. It was, it was out of his collection. It was off his shelf. It was a red book, 
and it had an image of an angel with an eagle's head on it. And he said, you know, those stories you hear about uh, a magician, you know, chanting his spells and then he messes up a word and like his head explodes or something. And I was like, yeah, you know, it's a common trope in, mytho in, in, in fiction. And he said, yeah, this is the origin of those of that concept of that idea. And I opened the book and of course, um, first thing I see is all of these bizarre words and, you know, that they, they don't even look pronounceable, you know, and they're all spelled in all caps and it's got all of these invocations and it's talking about how exalted and powerful these angels are. And it was like, right then I knew I, I had to crack this. I had to know what this was, you know? So that was the first, and that book was actually, um, Oh, I want to call. I want to say it was Practical Anakian Magic by Gerald and Betty Schuler, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. which was, as far as an introduction to Anakian go, I, that's probably the worst book you could possibly pick up. It's, the the Schuler Anakian material is just is just not not very good. But that was my first introduction, and I think the first two or three books I bought were actually Schuler Anakian books. As I was trying to pick through this and figure out what the hell it was, and and uh, it, and it just went from there, you know, I would find the next book and the next book and the rest is history. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It, it sounds actually it's it's a bit like me is that I, I think in the mid 90s, I found on like Usenet or something like that, some Enochian, the Enochian calls and uh, our angelical calls. I'll, I'll call them Enochian because that's the vernacular and we're trapped in it. It's fine. Um, but um, we both know it's not. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I remember thinking to myself as like whatever a 14 year old or a 13 year old, like if these angels are speaking a language and it has a grammar and syntax and it's not a human language, then there's something here. This needs to be, I think it's the same thing, right? I need to figure this out. Got to figure uh, it out. Yeah. yeah it's just, you and know, the Anakin system does that to you. It's it, yeah. it presents itself to you as a puzzle. No, that's right. It, and it's like you follow these little threads. It's like you think you found something. It's like, oh, I'm going to follow this through. And then you get halfway down and it just throws a roadblock. And it's like, nope, that's not what this was. And you're like, ah, and you got to go back to the drawing board. And then you pick up the next thread. And it's just, mm -hmm. it's like that. it'll do that for to, to you for years. You know, you just slam into one brick wall after the other. It's always pretending it's going to unveil itself to you just at the next turn. Right. And then, nope. It, not, not at all. It's just more questions. <laughs> yeah, it, it's and I think, yeah, I think that's what's so seductive about it is that it is like uh, it, it, you know, it's carrot and stick, uh, although I will say that it's more stick than carrot half the time. Um, but yeah, it, it really does have that effect. And I think that's why I think that's also why people get into it, but also don't really do the hard work of reading it. You know, like it's it, it's hard like to get into these. You know, people are like, oh, they may read True and Faithful Relation or maybe read parts of it. But, you know, the reality is True and Faithful Relation. I think as I, I joked, it's neither true nor faithful. Um, and that not only that, but I mean, even if we had an actual true and faithful copy of these right. journals, you still couldn't just sit down and read it. No, it's very not come away thinking you understand it. You'll come away feeling like you understand less than when you started. That's right. And that's just, you know, also because be like studied, not read, it has to be right. researched, not read, you know? So, right. And as we talked about, I think we we're talking about this before, right. Is that even if you read one page and you think you get the page, well, something about that page is going to be revealed 50 pages later down the diary two years Revealed later or corrected yeah. yeah and it'll be in a little marginal note somewhere that you would you'd miss it if you weren't looking for it you know right yeah yeah i think that's what you know when i tell people like you know as much as i say you know see people say i practice this enochian system i'm like i if I, someone asked me if i had to build a system out of it i would be daunted to do it and i think one can and i think you've done a noble effort to do it um but there's still gaps in what we know and understand and what things work. And even the Libra Loga has section, you know, some of the later tablets or have whole letters missing and it's a mess. It's, it's really, it's, um, it's incredibly, incredibly tantalizing because the promises are positively the biggest promises ever made. I would say in the history of magic, I, I think, I think I'd I say so unless you're going to compare it to the old Merkava mystics. Right, right, By right. Way, you're, you're, you're in both systems. You're being promised that, Hey, these, these are the Hayat. These are the angels that attend God's right. throne. Right. There are no higher angels than this. Right. So yeah, there's a big promise there. Yeah. Yeah. I think you're right. I think, and I think that that's the reason why, and you'd make the comparison between Merkava mysticism, right. And, um, 
and the Nokian system. And I think that I don't think there's a, a genetic connection there, but I think that there is an analogy, a strong analogy in term, even in terms of the way that the system imagines you descending to God's throne. And that's where the golden dawn really gets things kind of backwards, actually. Yeah, we go up and so yeah, you down. go up instead of go descend. down. Yeah, and you yeah. descend in, in the actual aethers. And I and yeah. to me as a person who's you know very grounded in, in the in the Merkava world, I mean that was I remember as a young person being like that's conspicuous. Yeah, <laughs> like weird. Like there's and a lot no of people other... who study like the Golden Dawn system that's really a, a stumbling block for them when they hit the Anakian material, the, the deep purest Anakian material, because right. in their mind, they naturally, like with the ethers, they want to start at Tex, the lowest ether, and they want right. to scry and work their way up. That's what Alistair Crowley did. That's what he Crowley did, yeah. Did because yeah. He was yeah. a golden donner. That's how he thought it worked. But if you read the journals, no, you're actually supposed to, like the Merkava mystics, first you generate this vision of, of God himself, and then right. you start working your way back down through the heavens to Earth, so... Yeah, it's yeah. It's, that was it, one of the one of the keys that that kind of went into the the first volume of my exploration of the language was D's attempt to make a Christian version of Merkava mysticism or a, or even an early Christian Kabbalah. He was trying to work out. So well, he's certainly the certainly the latter, I would say. I mean, he was self consciously trying to very absolutely by, by Kabbalah. I mean, um, so um, and uh, you know the Christian Kabbalah was very young at that time. I mean, so he. If, if people, if his journals had gotten out sooner, I think we would be naming him with like Marandola, you know, and, and those guys who were the very first Christian Kabbalists. But no one thinks of D as an early Christian Kabbalist, but that's what he was trying to do. Yeah, well, I think that I think that his his I especially in in, um, in the Monas Glyphica in the introduction, he's very much about he's saying, look, I'm using Kabbalah and things like that. In fact, I'm making an episode with uh, the modern hermeticist Dana Trail uh, next Friday on Yo on uh, Reuchlin, on uh, De Verbo Mirificio, the Wonder Working World uh, Word, the first text published by by uh, Reuchlin. And um, sounds great. I'll be talking about how it affect how it actually influenced D. Um, and in fact, I think it was one of the main texts D had oh, read wow. in terms of uh, which still has no English translation. That, that text has no English translation, unfortunately. Um, and why do you think this system is so popular given that is, uh, that it is so complicated and such a, such a mess it, and even more than just the things that it promises. But aside from that, what do you, what do you, why do you think it, why do you think a has, has, uh, gone on to the kind of popularity it has? Well, I think it has a lot to do with, um, uh, how it was popularized, you know, because like you said, aside from his promises, I mean, any, any, any magical system that's telling you that you're going to contact the highest of the high angels to literally influence world events, that's going to attract people. And, you know, just like you and I, that language sucks you in too. that you see those words and you're wanting to know what's going on there. And that'll, that'll just drag you right in. But like I said, it's, it's also popularization, you know, like you can say that Batman is a superhero that is just for some weird reason always popular everyone's always going to love batman he'll always be here but if you look at the history it was actually the 60s it was actually adam west and the batman show his batman show that made batman popular and uh Inokian's adam west was alistair crowley he made Inokian <laughs> popular you know mm. he published the vision and the voice right. and he he tried everything he did everything he could to make himself the big bad evil magician you know in the world in, in his day and so Enochian is what he was using Enochian is what he was that was what he considered the best and most powerful so that's where it, and and you probably know um and 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 those with us who are old enough to remember there was a period um I'd say before maybe the 90s, maybe the late 80s, but there was this period through the, the 60s, the 70s, and even into the 80s where Thelema was pretty much it. I mean, the Golden Dawn hadn't exactly resurged yet. Uh, chaos magic hadn't even really come about yet. I mean, it was just kind of in the in the wings there um, with, you know, Peter Carroll and those guys. But Thelema is what everyone was doing. That was modern Western occultism. So in know, Wicca, think, yeah, and and Wicca, but yeah. Wicca in Wicca, um, in many ways, I, yeah. As I as I've written previously, Wicca was just another version of Thelema. 
Mm-hmm. It was an Earth-based version of Thelema. So Thelema influenced Wicca. Thelema influenced, uh, you know, the, the fascination with Anakiana. Uh, Thelema influenced uh, the modern Golden Dawn, you know. Chick Cicero was a Thelemite when he founded the Golden Dawn. So, yeah, I really think that is what popularized it, mm. yeah, especially the vision and the voice. Mm-hmm. And so people keep returning to that. And uh, so it's just, it's stayed with us. And then you get, you know, a few people like me and, and others who have been keeping that torch kind of alive today. But the big movement now seems to be to go back to the, de- the, the deep purest material. Right. Uh, rather than the Golden Dawn slash the Lemic version, which is very different. It's like an entirely different tradition of Anakian magic. Yeah. And I, and I, I don't have a dog in the fight about which one is more or less uh, uh, effective or, or what have you, but yeah, I, I, I'm personally more interested in, you know, the, the D material just because that's where my wheelhouse is. Um, um, but again, I read the vision, the voice and I'm impressed by whatever Crowley did. It produced something very impressive. Um, and it's not for me to judge whether it's authentic Enochian magic or whatever. I, I don't have a dog in that fight. Them as different, they're just different traditions. I mean, they even use different versions of the great table. So it's just two separate paths. Right. Yeah. You know, and, it, and both of them are fine. You yeah. Know? It's not it's certainly not for me to judge. Uh, and I find the vision of voice to be a, a incredibly powerful prophetic, you know, piece of religious literature that, mm-hmm. um, you know, it's one of those things where this is one of the many places where I get to be very lucky, but I don't have to pick. I can be like, yeah, the D stuff is like amazing. And the people are like, so you're a D purist? I'm like, no, I'm a religious studies scholar. You just I, study religious studies. <laughs> yeah. I, I don't have to be, uh, um, I don't have to be, uh, I don't have to be hammered down to, you know, some kind of or, you know, occult orthodoxy. Um, so yeah. that that's in many ways, that's really, that's fantastic. Um, what's, what do you think is a big misconception? for you uh, that you hear a lot about the, the D material, just the D material. Um, like what's a, what's a misconception that you, you hear a lot about when people learn to do a, a Nokia and Nokia magic, or they they've learned yeah, about the material. What are some so of the many of them? I mean, it's like, you take, God, there's so many of them. We could, we could do a whole show just on misconceptions. Yeah. Alone. I would say one of the biggest is now we're going back to that who popularized a Nokia magic. And I put a lot of that with Crowley, but, Crowley did that because of the Golden Dawn and because the Golden Dawn was so foundational to modern Western occultism, um, they tended to elevate Anakian magic to like the most important thing. And, um, but as part of that, they maintained that Anakian magic was just this skeletal system, that there was really no system there, you know, and that they, the Golden Dawn, are the ones who made Anakian magic an actual workable system. And that mm-hmm. without them, it would have just been, it was just this incomplete little, you know, uh, sketch of ideas in an old journal somewhere. And big part of my work is trying to show people that it is not a skeletal system. In fact, most of it is intact. It is a mess, like you said, mm-hmm. but most of it's there if you can ferret it out. Um, the very, you know, like people point to the, uh, the, the journal entries we lost because a maid was draining pies on them. Um, but the information that seems to have been lost in there, most of that is actually in Dee's personal grimoire, which he called right. the Clavis Angelica, um, and the, and the, uh, Mist, uh, Heptarchia Mystica, his personal journal retains a lot of what was lost there. And that, I'm just giving that as one example. There's so many places where people think things are lost or not fleshed out. But when you dig deep enough, you find out there really is a complete magic system there. There's only just a few little bits and pieces that I would say are actually missing that I'd really like to see, but not even enough to make the system unworkable, in my opinion. Hmm. So that's one of the biggest misconceptions that is it's incomplete and that it wouldn't be complete if it weren't for the Golden Dawn. And that's why I put so much stress on the deep purest material and showing people what's what was actually there, because it's pretty incredible the 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 breadth and the the depth of what is there right. and you know i'm i wanted people to see that because that's what fascinated me about it all yeah i think you're right that that if you read it in its sort of synchronic totality it's not so much that stuff is missing there are things that are missing but that it their problem is most people rely on either true and faithful relation or 
people making things up on the internet and true and faithful relations. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It, so people making things up on the internet is not a great source and true and faithful relation is a great starting point and still a very defective text. Um, very, very defective. Yeah. yeah. It's a pretty defective text. You know, we, we talked about there are pages out of order. Uh, Cause of on intentionally misrepresents D to forward his own agenda to make D. I mean, people forget this thing was published to make D look like a necromancer and God mm -hmm. forbid an Anabaptist. Um, and so we, you shouldn't trust a text that's published for the sole purpose of defaming a person. Right. Like no, what person would build a spiritual system and trust it knowing that it was published by someone who hated them, you know, and there were no checks and balances. There were editorial staff. No, 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 he could have made any changes he wanted. Right. And, and he I'm kind of surprised that he didn't make a lot of changes, you know, that at least that we know of. But, right. you know, I would have expected a lot of omissions and rewriting and all sorts of stuff. But he just kind of I, I think he was of the opinion that the journals were bad enough as they were. Oh, yeah. I think so. I think it was the classic. <laughs> it, it was the expose. Right. right. That's the classic way. Then, and it's sort of, yeah. yeah, it's the expose. Like, I don't have to tell you how bad it is. I can just tell you what it is and you'll realize how bad it was. And you'll realize how bad it is. And um, the exact opposite happened. Everyone went, everyone wow, thanks, Cosbon. <laughs> yeah. Now we're going to probably forget about you. And, uh, and we're going to start uh, using this stuff. Yeah, it, we'll it, was like, it was like Scott publishing Discovery of Witchcraft. Witchcraft right. is bad. Don't ever do it. Step one. <laughs> yeah. Here's how to do it. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It's, 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 a it's, a, it's a Streisand effect. Um, it's a, yeah, it's a Streisand effect. Yeah, I'll, I'll pull this up. This is my, I guess, one that I find that uh, when I've uh, studied Enochian stuff is uh, people get so big and scared of uh, the, the demon of the abyss, uh, Coronzon. Um, um, and it, yeah, and it's so funny that people are so terrified of Coronzon, except for his name isn't that. Or its name isn't that. Their name is not that. It's Coronzom. Correct. Like, I hear so much about Coronzom, but D never called it that. D never called this demon. No, never. It was never the demon of the abyss. Anyway, it was certainly a. It's a no, devil. No, no. That's a complete it's, later. That's a, that's a Crowley edition. It's a Crowley that edition. Right. Yeah. Coronzom and the the death, the death dragon. It's, it's just the devil. Right. It's, it's basically, it's it was basically the, devil. the devil as the embodiment of time. Right. And time you can see and, and, and in the sense of entropy and death. And, you know, time is what makes us suffer here in the physical world. And that's what Karanzam was. Yeah. You know? Yep. And you can see there, right there, it's an M. It's not yeah. an N. Yeah. And it's just, but, but if you look at true and faithful relation, he has an N there. And that's he why has an in there. most modern texts, that error yep. just keeps getting repeated. Yeah. And it keeps, and this is where I say people like, uh, you know, and it's not CH, right? Some people think it's CH. It's not CH, it's CO. Mm -hmm. uh, right. It's right there in D's handwriting. And I always tell people, you need to go back to the manuscripts. You cannot rely on a 17th century political, mm -hmm. uh, 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 a, you know, like a hack job. If you're going to build your spirituality around it, you need to go back to these texts because, and this is a minor thing, but you know, yeah, but I there's don't know. a thousand of these. And this is why yeah. I said the academic side is so important. Yeah. I, you know, occultists tend to just transcribe the same errors over and over. Academics will go back and say, no, wait a minute. I'm comparing this against the original source and it's not right. Right. And so that's to me just a, a funny thing where I'm, you know, having read it, I remember, I remember going back to the Crowley stuff and, you know, Chrome zone this and Chrome zone that. And I was like, who the hell? Is oh, it's Chrome zone. Um, Chrome yeah. Zone. Yeah. So, yep. So it's one of these, just, uh, I don't know. And the root of his name seems to uh, be shared with words for like to count, to number. Yeah. Or Kronos, I think, actually. Just time. Yeah. It's, uh, we found a, uh, in an old, I think it was Ben Rowe found it actually back in yeah. the day, but uh, it was a, uh, a divine name in an old grimoire. I'm forgetting the source now, but it was Hakorason. Right. Yeah. So it was like the 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 Hebrew Ha and then right. Kor Kor Korozum. Kor Koros, yeah. Or Kronos. Uh, or, oh no, that's right. It was it was Ha Kronos. That's Kronos. Yeah. Yeah. That's what. Uh, yeah. It was always that. That was been always my thing. It was that it was you know some version of Kronos. And when you have lots of roots like the Kaos becomes the root for Earth, mm -hmm. uh, and and uh, and uh, and the in the Enochian. So, um, yeah, but you know, this funny. is another good example of what you talked about in your video that, uh, you do find angelical words that seem to have, um, earthly origins. 
mm-hmm. like Karan Zom seems to come from Hakronos, right? And Londo comes from London, and Madrid, Madrid yeah. meaning iniquity, right? Is the yeah, name of the so capital city of the nation, the Spanish that Empire, yeah. War was. All right. <laughs> so All right. yeah, there's there's a bit of D's mind and Kelly's mind, right? Luki Fikitas. Uh, mm-hmm. is, is another one. Yeah. So yeah, it's, yeah, there's, yeah. um, all right, let me get the time. We have a couple yeah, time for, let me do a couple more questions and we'll jump into the chat if that's okay with you. Um, awesome. let's see. Um, so one of the things I get a lot when I talk to people about this, uh, Nokiana is that it can make you crazy, right? That it, it can cause you to have mental breakdowns. It can cause you to have a psychotic episode. And I will say this, and I won't, I won't be specific about it because I want to protect identities. But when I was studying in Amsterdam, we were given a talk about, look, there are all these things you can be studying. If you study them, especially D stuff, we've had people had, we've had people have mental problems and they specifically mentioned the D stuff, right? Mm-hmm. The D stuff got like, you know, no one said, if you become a rosy Christian, you're going to go crazy. You know, no one ever says that. Um, right. but it was the D stuff that got specifically labeled. And I, and I hear people tell me like, will I go crazy if I study Enoki and stuff? Um, I don't know that I'm particularly crazy. I, your mileage may vary. <laughs> don't we have to be to study this kind of stuff? <laughs> we have at least somewhat, we have to at least be unusual. Uh, but strange yeah, why do you, and strange and unusual. Yeah. Um, so why do you think it has that? Why do you think it has that uh, that uh, that, well, that 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 uh, that reputation stigma? Yeah. Well, I mean, first I got to give a disclaimer because as a practitioner, I have to say that there's kind of a conception that you know demons are dangerous, angels are safe, yeah. and that is not true. And it's it's not true if you're working in Nokian magic which it, that happens to, to deal with some of the most exalted angels in the universe, or if you're dealing with just the Solomonic system, or if you're working in the Kabbalah with golden, you know, like Hermetic Kabbalah and golden Dawn type stuff, or even uh, traditional Hebrew Kabbalah. If you're working with these angels, they can be dangerous. The angels can bite you and, and, and you can get burned pretty easily. So that's just something everyone should know going in. Um, you're not dealing with a safe art. And there are a lot of stumbling blocks and things that can go wrong. But then why should Anakian have that reputation more than any other? Well, part of it is the misconceptions we were talking about. And I just focused on that one. Uh, but it, like I said, there's so many others. There's um, The Anakian angels are really aliens. The Anakian angels are really interdimensional beings uh, from some bizarre, you know, other, other realm. Um, I've heard, uh, oh, there was someone in the Golden Dawn. Uh, this is this is generations ago, not not the modern order. But she, uh, 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 her name was Bailey. And she decided that everything to do with Anaki and magic was evil, that they were all demons, you know. And, mm-hmm. and you'll get people that will pick up um, on, like, what she had to say and even what Kelly had to say. Because remember the, the, is- the incidents in the, grim- in, uh, the Grim Wars, in the journals, where Kelly would flip out and say, these oh, are Kelly. angels, these are demons. You oh, know? Right. Kelly constantly and, flipping out, yeah. Yeah, and people will pick that out and they'll focus on that. So there's this, there's your misconception, is that there's this kind of reputation that is not really earned that it is dangerous and that the entities are evil. So a lot of that stuff just gets passed on without any real practical backing for it it's just they heard that it was dangerous so they tell you it's dangerous and then you tell the next person um so there's that um but beyond those two um i think one of the main things that makes the Anakian system dangerous is we kind of talked about it already people tend not to go back to the journals they tend to just look at true and faithful relation, or they tend to just look at maybe what Regardi wrote in the Golden Dawn, uh, or Pat Zalewski. He published uh, Anaki and Magic of the Golden Dawn. I I had that book in my early days too. Um, they will look at uh, oh God forbid what the Schulers wrote about it, and if you take all of that material and try to put it into practice, you're not understanding it, and you're going to end up really ma- making bad mistakes. 
And I, I think a lot of people get burned that way because they're trying to use the system they don't understand and they're misapplying it in very subtle ways. Mm. Um, a great example, uh, I know of many magicians, they, they wanna write uh, an Anakian invocation or, or maybe names on, on their tools or a talisman. And they'll just take English words and just transliterate them into angelical. And that's not how it works. It, it, it's a separate language. And there's a way that you have to actually translate English text into angelical. So I think people are just don't use any adjectives. <laughs> not, you know, not many, uh, yeah. not many articles, you know, right. uh, the word I and and uh, articles, conjunctions, they do exist in the language, but they're rarely used. You right. know, it's so if, if, you, if, if this language is the language of the angels and it is a sacred tongue and it is a thing of power, then I think that misapplying it and just randomly writing letters because you've translated, you know, you want a Kawasaki. So you just write out Kawasaki in angelical letters, you know, and it's just, and it doesn't work. And I think that's, it's, it's misapplying the system, not just the le letters, but the rituals and who and who and what you think the angels are you know if you call these guys and you think they're aliens then you're not you're not in the right mind place to talk to these angels you know mm -hmm. so it's just such a misunderstood and misapplied system that i am not surprised that there are so many horror stories of people just not getting the results out of it that they thought they were supposed to right yeah i i would say also that i mean I don't know what the nature of angels is, but I, I, I would say that that D certainly thought and traditionally thought that angels are terrifying. Like no one until now, the 20th century basically thought that angels were like your friend. Angels right. were like these military. They were like the Marines of the skies. They're the Marines of heaven. And they weren't there it's to like help you. The they were. Yeah, they're those. They're, yeah. yeah, literally the, the Tseva Oat. It literally it, the, the word actually means army. Like, mm -hmm. I don't know why we translated it as, as host. It's completely a bad translation now. The word in yeah. Hebrew just means army. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, and so that the Tzfaot, uh, the idea that these are, you know, basically the Marines of the upper regions of the heavens. Um, I mean, do you want to go like pester a Navy SEAL? <laughs> pester those guys? Yeah. I mean, like, it, 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 this is one thing that I, I run into this when I'm, I'm teaching people. Um is that if, if you look in the old Midrashim, uh, even in the even in the, the the Old Testament itself, I mean, when humans encounter these, or when when humans and angels have encounters with each other, it's not usually pleasant, and the angels typically do not like humans. Oh yeah, low tira. You know, don't they don't they don't like to be pestered by us. They don't like God's apparent favor of us. They don't. I mean, they just we really irritate them. Right. And, you know, firstly, in our in our mystical systems, we tend to focus on the ones that kind of tend to get along with us. Michael, Gabriel, Raphael, they tend to be nice to us more often than not. <laughs> but, you know, even those guys and most other angels, yeah, they would they could just trod right over you and not even realize you were there. You know, right. They're no, it, it, epochal powers. Right. You know? In the Midrashim, actually, the angels actually argue with God that we shouldn't be created at all. Yeah, they didn't um, want us here at all. They said we're going to create war. We're going to pollute the earth. Yeah, gonna... And yeah. guess what we did? Yeah. <laughs> right. And, and and I tell my students this all the time. It's like, you know, this is all about the relationship. Magic is all about the relationship you build with these entities. Because if a hundred monkeys contact them, it's for stupid stuff. And it's for things that irritate them. And if you can make yourself the one that stands up above the crowd and actually earns their respect that's where the magic comes in. That's where they'll start working for and with you, where they'll start teaching you, you know, but if you're just another, another idiot trying to masturbate over a sigil so you can get laid, then they're just not interested in you. You know, you're just at the most, they're going to toy with you. <laughs> you know, no, right. And so, you get the sense that, and, and it's funny because that's, uh, you say that because that's people forget that that's a good bit of what the angels did to D and Kelly. They just, strung them along like yep. they were like oh you want to have fairy you want to yo you're interested in buried treasure okay yeah, how long I'll, did they string them along over that buried treasure oh yeah i'll give you a buried. i'll give you a treasure 
They um, told him, oh, you write out, you write liberal, oh God, write out the fair copy of that. And we're going to open you all the treasure. Yeah. We're going to tell you where the treasure is. Yeah. And it was years later that yeah. Malvage, I think it was Malvage, or it might've been uh, Illamese, but he came in and said, by the way, guys, you know, they were lying. They were just stringing you along. Yeah. You're like, yeah. like <laughs> Because we had never had any intention of leading you to your stupid treasure. We were no, leading that- you to the treasures of heaven. Right. And that whole buried treasure thing with the map. I mean, people forget there's a there is a literal Goonies treasure. There's map. a whole saga. A whole I saga. almost wrote that saga. I was um, me and an academic uh, by the name of Terry Burns. Mm-hmm. And she writes a lot of Anakian material, but she's really into the cloak and daggery of it all. And me and her, I mean, this is God, 20 years ago. We were about we were going to get together and write that saga. Oh, it's and and, the, and present the, and then we never did. And the I'm alchemical so code and the little map oh, and the, the alchemical powder and, yeah. and searching through these graves and everything. It was a hell of a trip. Oh, it was, I mean, if anyone all in wants, the middle of this, <laughs> in the middle of all of this, it's the most Dungeons and Dragons y part of the entire mm-hmm. Inakiana. You didn't have the talismans with the demon faces. Oh, yeah, them. yeah. And that. you had it like, yeah. And, you, and I just like, I remember reading that as like a teenager being like, I would like literally have, I had true and faithful relation. Right. And I mm-hmm. had it like ILL. So I only had it for two weeks at a time. And I remember oh, it, cause wow. it's, it's near the beginning of, uh, of the, of, uh, of this. Yes. Right after the Heptarchia sections. At least. Right, I think it actually starts in the five books of the mystery. Right. It does. Yeah. Cause that's, and then it carries it, over and it true carries over to the very beginning of cotton appendix one. And I remember looking at this as like a, you know, 15 year old. And I remember looking over my D and D notes being like, it's the same thing. <laughs> like that means it can make an episode of stranger things (laughs) you totally good you could totally be like you could just lift it right out and be like oh like and again it's funny because we can make fun of this and they're not make fun of it but like it's funny like we should let it be funny and when i mention it to people who are all about like a knocking magic and this and that and the other and i'm like yeah what about the big treasure map part and they're like what treasure map part treasure map like, oh i've seen like, people dude. bend over backwards to try to make like those talismans i mentioned no. part of the anakian system no you know they, and they're not they're not seeing that this is its own little self-contained saga yeah within the journals i had nothing it's like uh another one it's not as funny but uh the silver leafed book no the yeah angels kept telling him make this silver leaf book make this it never book. occurred never have it and it took me yeah. quite a while to figure out because if, if, if you read older uh anakian books um I'm not sure if uh, uh, Jeffries says this or not, but a lot of the old Anakin books will say that that silver leaf book was supposed to be liberal Loga, that that was the fair copy, but it wasn't. It no, was there's a clear description of liberal Loga. Yeah. Right. Yeah, Libra Loga has and a very then, clear description of what it is. Yeah. And this book of yeah. silver leaves was totally different. And since he never made it, the angels refused to tell him what they were going to have him put in it. So it just dies right there. But yeah, there's all these little sagas, whether they go anywhere or just peter out. There's all these little stories in the journals that are just fascinating. Yeah, I totally agree. And that's why, I, again, for me as like an academic, that's like, that's what I love. I don't, I don't have a dog in the fight of whether I'm going to like get a vision of God. If I do this for me, mm. it just stands as a authentic mystery. It and really is. that's enough. I don't need it to be more than that. It's like, this is an authentic mystery that crosses and it's mixed up in the history of philosophy, the history of, of, of religion, the history of philology, the history of codes, the history of all these things is wrapped up in, in this, these, this collection of manuscripts is a nexus for all that. And people are like, why would you study it? And I'm like, why wouldn't why would I study not? it? Exactly. <laughs> right. This is, this is one of the this most is- interesting pieces of, of of english history maybe that that have ever been put to paper right and again i i tell people like no one would read beowulf if it weren't for tolkien historically yeah. right Boy. and yeah. and I, I and i really will drive this home there's no reference of beowulf in any ancient text no other saga mm-hmm. mentions beowulf no other saga mentions anything beowulf did no one apparently read that manuscript aside from the very small section of the end where he fights the dragon. Beowulf was an unknown document until Tolkien picked it up and decided it was the most important piece of old English literature. And now everybody who speaks English has had a class on Beowulf in high school. 
I was about to say, I we studied in high school when I was in high school back in yeah. the nineties. Yep. It's 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 a survival bias. It survived. One guy who wrote something really famous decided it was really famous and became famous. And see, that's what we said about Anaki and Magic right. earlier. It was this one guy, <laughs> Crowley, who decided it was important because the Golden Dawn had taught him it was, and right. the rest is history. Everyone right. followed suit. Right. So it's just funny about what becomes important, what doesn't, and what becomes important for what reasons. Like the Mona Lisa, no one cared about until she, that pain got stolen, until JFK showed up and decided it was important. Decided no one important. cared about the Mona Lisa. And in fact, if you go to the Louvre today, you will go, if you, you're walking to the Louvre from, you know, whatever this direction, you turn right and there's the Mona Lisa and there's a 50,000 tourist in there. If you turn left, there's another Da Vinci in the next room to the left. And there are three people in there. No one goes in. And that's where and all it, the good stuff is. Yeah. And it's really great because that painting <laughs> is of inventions and stuff. Yeah. Right. Or, or it's actually, it's a, it's a, it's an incomplete Da Vinci and you can see him sketching and changing things. So oh, it actually wow. is better because you get a sense into how he's actually thinking about how to do the painting. And so yeah. forensically, it's actually very interesting in a way that the Mona Lisa isn't. Now, I'm not to say the Mona Lisa is a bad painting or whatever. I don't know anything about paintings. I'm just saying it's the Mona Lisa is a Kardashian of paintings. She's famous say, yeah, because for being it's, famous. <laughs> it's fa Yeah, people, the people who are crowded over there aren't even really interested in it. They just want to be able to say they went to see it. See the Mona Lisa. It's again, it's a Saw Kardashian of paintings. Yep. It's a famous, it was go. famous for being famous. So um, let me do one more. We'll do more questioning and, and take to the, to the crowd. But yeah, it's um, yeah. I think that the Nokian stuff is funny because of the way that um, it's gotten publicized. Um, and, it, and, and maybe I'll say this, right? I think Voltaire said the Bible is more celebrated than known. More people celebrate the Bible than read the damn thing. I think that the John uh, D. Yeah. Chat, Right, the John D. Tax are more celebrated than known. People talk a Absolutely. big game about it, Anokiana, but do they really go back into Cotton Appendix number one, Sloan 3189, Sloan 3192, Cotton Appendix number two, and get into these texts? My general idea is that most people don't because right. it's not because people are bad scholars or whatever, it's just a pain in the ass. It's just <laughs> but that's for sure. Yeah, that's for sure. Um, it's like I, I get I get irritated with people like um, Abermellon. Uh, I would say if you meet a hundred people who say they've studied Abermellon, ninety nine of them have actually just read Mather's introduction to his edition of the book, and that's right. about it. You know, and why not just read further? But with Anakian magic, it's not going to help you to just read further. <laughs> you know, it's it is a whole lifetime of study. Right. And it's just, it's, it's amazing. I mean, I would, I, I wouldn't have it any other way, but it is not, it's a monolith you have to chisel away at. And hopefully my books will make that easier. I really do. I hope that I've taken this, this whole big thing that just seems so overwhelming. You know, I was the, the nerdy guy that had no social life. So I just sat there with my copy of true and faithful relation and I read it page by page, you know, and I had the time to do that. And so I hope that my work just makes the whole thing more accessible to everybody. And that's, that's my intention is to cut through the treacle as they used to say. <laughs> mm -hmm. I guess the last question, maybe we can drill down to the Enochian, uh, Enochian language. Um, which again is another great misconception that that's never that what D called it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But it's the uh, celestial speech or the Adamical language, the closest thing that I think that, or you'll notice um, in my work, I settle on the angelical language, yeah, yeah. which which uh, I differentiate from angelic because angelic is an adjective. Angelical right. is the proper name. So it's but it's just the one I picked out of the list D gave because like you said, he said Adamical, celestial mm -hmm. speech, uh, first tongue of God, Christ right. and angelical. He named it all four of those. So I just picked right. one. I picked the one I liked. <laughs> yeah, I always, <laughs> and I, went with it. I always like celestial speech. There's a there's a musicality like to that one. Yeah, that's yeah. the one I always. But uh, any specific remarks? And I'm and I'm really I'm I'm going to ask you a, a pointy question. Um, mm -hmm. And the pointy question is: uh, I know in some of your books you mentioned that you're working on public publishing something um, about Libra Loga, really to bring uh, about sort of what you discovered in Libra Loga. And I'm really curious about where that is because um, I think Libra Loga is the. I mean, I, I don't know about what you think. But for me, that's the big mystery. 
the biggest mystery of the entire shebang is the first table of Libra Loga. Yeah, that I think is the primer. I really yeah. believe they gave us that to teach us how to use everything else. Mm -hmm. um, where is that at? Uh, it hasn't been worked on, God, it may be a decade. Uh, I still have all the work, mm -hmm. uh, and I need to get back to it. Um, but first, a little background. Um, the way I created the lexicon that you have now, uh, uh, volume two of that of that series, um, I started at... Now, this is aside from combing through the journals for every word that the angels said in their own language. But just looking at the keys, I started with word, the first word of the first call. And so I would just say, ol, and I'd look at the next word, which is sanv, and I would say, ol, is there anything in sanv that seems similar to ol? No. And I'd go to word three, which is vorge, and I would say, ol, and is there anything in there? Ol, 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 all the way through the entirety of the keys. And then I would go back to call one, word two. And I would do the same thing, every single word. And this was just, this took years. Um, that is exactly what I did with the first page of Loga as well. Mm -hmm. I just started with the first word in the first cell and went through every single word that it had. Um, it is. It was not as easy a process as it was with the calls because with the calls, I started getting very uh, recognizable word groupings. Mm -hmm. Like when I pointed out that the root of Koranzam seems to be shared with other words for counting and number. Mm -hmm. um, and you'll see that uh, through the keys. You do see that through the through Loga. But we, number one, we don't have definitions for most of those words. Right. No. Uh, that was a huge, because not only was I comparing the spelling of words in the keys, but also their definitions. That's why I caught a lot of root words that I wouldn't have noticed otherwise, because they just had similar definitions. We don't have that help in Loga. So right. all I'm looking for are similarities in spelling. And I very quickly learned that it would not work with a computer because the same word can be spelled differently in different places. You can tell mm -hmm. it's the same word, but D just maybe Kelly spoke it differently or wrote it phonetically differently or something. I don't know. Um, and then on top of that, unlike in the keys, like I said, there were these specific word groups. I found in Loga, they cross over a lot. Like one word group, all the words there will be similar but some of those words will also be similar to words in this word group. And they, those, that group will have words that are similar to this group. So I was never able to even narrow it down to specific groupings of spellings and conjugations and stuff. So it's really this, it's kind of like diving into a sea of letters really, you know? And right. So where it is right now is I do have a lot of those word groupings separated out and I've tried to cross note, uh, cross note where these words seem similar to these words and these words seem similar to these words. Right. Um, and that's where it is right now. A bunch of handwritten notes and just an attempt to find similarities in spellings. Right. And that's, that's where I kind of stopped way back. Like I said, probably 10 years ago or more. And it's all just sitting there. I, mean, I can actually point at it. I can look <laughs> at it where it is. It's sitting over there just begging me to get back to it someday. Well, if you want, if you ever want to get back to it, uh, one of the things I really want to do, and I've reached out to some folks, is I want to reach out to some computational linguistic folks to, you know, turn turn machine learning at this because machine learning in terms of language is way further than it was ten years ago, and uh, machine learning in language is crazy powerful these days, and I'd be curious to to take that tool and begin to see what what can be learned. Um, yeah, let us see if an AI can can notice yeah. the differences in spellings, but still notice that they're yeah, and that would be, yeah, it, that it certainly can. Easier. Yeah, and, you know we've done and we've done the same thing with uh, Voynich, and I'll be making an episode about the Voynich manuscript uh, pretty soon. Oh, that good. Good. some it actually summarizes why I think Voynich is a medieval hoax, why there's no underlying language, and it, it and that argument is based on computational linguistics um, that mm -hmm. says that this is the reason why this is not behaving like a language. Um, it's good. Which is I also like, I've, I, yeah, I've done some of that kind of work. I'm a, you know, I'm an amateur linguist. And so I've done some of that work with uh, Loga and, <laughs> and yeah. And, um, and yeah, I've done some of that with Loga and the calls and, 
you look at Zipf's laws and linguistic entropy and you can see like, oh yeah, these are different mathematically, right? But not distinct, you know, they're not English and Japanese, right? Right. So they're, right, right? they're, they're, they're different, but not distinct. And so I think there's some interesting things about to, to say more about that. And I want to, I'll put the can on that and talk about it more later, but I'll be doing something on the Vornik. Um, awesome. On the Vornik thing, the Vornik's also close to my heart. As you can see, the Vornik and D and all this stuff, that you know, the Venn diagram of people interested in these things are, you know. <laughs> You're right. Yeah. Because it's, um, the, ling it's the languages. You it's know, the languages. Just, it's and, and the need to decipher. Yep. The the desire to, to be confronted with something perplexing and want to make sense of it. I think it's a... Mm -hmm. It's a it's a deeply human thing, but also I will say that's a deeply mystical impulse. And I really yeah, like, right. like for me, I own both those. Like people want to say, are you a practitioner? I'm like, no. Do I consider myself mystically inclined? I might. I might. And where do I where do I cut into that? Uh, I was talking earlier with your significant other. And I was like, you know, I don't know that I practice magic or practice whatever, but I do think of myself as a calligrapher in terms of its spiritual value it's a spiritual practice oh, absolutely yeah and so um you know so no one's spirituality is is uh, simple or easy and certainly mine's not uh mine's not either um so let's let's jump up to some questions uh and we'll take some questions from the chat folks and i mean to say this again i know we're not gonna get to everyone's question because we're already at an hour and i, I don't want to keep aaron uh too much over um i told him an hour an hour 15 um, but you know, if we go to an hour 30, is that okay, Aaron? Hey, as long as you want, I'm, I'm fine. <laughs> okay. Uh, I, I will say that I'll begin to, uh, to get tired after an hour and a half. Um, but, um, so let me grab some questions. I'm going to scroll up. Let me just say folks, if I don't get your question and I really, I'm sorry if I don't, it's just, it's a long chat. It's a very eccentric chat, like all esoterica <laughs> chats. Um, I really try to be careful in terms of moderating the chat just because you know i don't want to silence people whatever um so if i don't get your question please don't feel insulted i'm not trying to like insult or silence anyone uh, i do want to prioritize the folks who've donated to the channel uh because they're keeping my lights on man the reason why you're seeing me is because i have to pay money to comcast keep my lights on so i want to prioritize their stuff just because i don't want to be a you know i hey you would do the same so um let's jump up and say um let me jump up and see. Um, start from the first and go up. So this is Gia B. Um, so she says, this is engaging. Solid Stereotute, a student looking for a mentor so I don't make dumb magical mistakes. Any recommendations? Um, Aaron, do you have any recommendations for either mentors or just general tips for, for not making magical mistakes? This is not my wheelhouse. So. <laughs> yeah. Um... All you, brother. I do see I do see where she's coming from, but I wouldn't really recommend anybody as a mentor. Basically, if somebody presents themselves to you as a mentor, run away because that's if you find a, a really good magical teacher, you should have to chase them down and put a gun to their head to get them to teach you. If they want to teach you, it's it's scary. Um, but you know, um, that said, I'm not going to tell you about how I'd like to teach you. But no, seriously, uh, I do offer classes. Um, so you're more than welcome, uh, to the classes that we offer. We can, uh, we can talk about where to find those later. Uh, books that I write are, uh, intended to be introductory, uh, like, uh, secrets of the magical grimoires and the essential Anakian grimoire. Uh, those are good places to start. And also if you go, uh, if you're on Facebook, I, uh, I host a, um, uh, Solomonic group and it's like a very very strictly moderated group it's not for general magical discussion it's for uh it, it's it's almost more academic except it's academic from the standpoint of a bunch of practitioners so we're talking about how we actually use the material um so in general you know your best bet is things like that you, you got to find good groups don't find groups full of kids who are just making it up as they go along uh, you want to find the scholars. You want to find the the authors who publish about this stuff. Have been doing it for a long time, and you know, just kind of become part of the community. I mean, it's easier today than it ever was in the past to just find the you know a good group of people and just start contributing and just and, and asking questions and taking part in the discussion. But as for you know telling you a mentor to seek out, I really couldn't recommend just any one specific person. Not even myself. You know, I'm not going to step forward and go, hey, you know, I'm. I'm your mentor, you know, 
you got to find out what it is that you want to do and then find out how to connect into that community. And once you do that, the teachers will start appearing. Yeah. And I would just say that, you know, that uh, general rules around teachers, no matter what they are, is you can ask questions. Uh, you can question authority. You can, you know, you can, you can ask for sources. You can ask for reasonable argumentation. Um, you know, anyone who rules from sheer authority alone, stay away from them. Um, well, and also, yeah. but also just, you can always leave and do something else. So, um, Absolutely. Yeah, but in general group, it's not for you. You can just go to another one. I mean, it's, yeah. you know, when I say a group, I mean, literally like online finding an actual physical group is a whole different ball of wax. Cause you, you want to make sure you don't get involved with a predatory group of people or, uh, uh, or some, or, or a fraudulent group of people, you know, or making claims that aren't true or, but I figure that's, that's a different show. That's probably not what she was asking for here. Yeah. Yeah. I would just say that, you know, when, when you have to check your critical thinking at the door, run. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. That my, so. The Boreal Beaver. Thank you for the super chat. Uh, great minds, great minds unite. I eh? <laughs> trying brother. Um, let me scroll back up and get a couple other of the super chats and stuff. Um, Max Kano. Thank you, brother. Um, the satanic church uses this language with some modifications. What do you think about LaVey's work? Imagine you imagine Aaron and I are going to have a different uh, opinion about this, but Aaron, shoot, yeah, if, you. I, I just, I, I'm not impressed. Um, because I know what you're referring to. It's in the it's in the back of the Satanic Bible, and all, all Levee did was he took the the calls as they are presented in uh, Golden Dawn and Thelemic work. Uh, he might have even taken them right out of Regardi's The Golden Dawn. I'm not sure, and then he kind of retranslated them to say what he wanted them to say, and it has nothing to do with what they really say. So you know, he kind of. Like, I think he made up a word, Satanus, and then he just replaced all of the instances of the word God with Satanus, and it's not an angelical word. So I just, I wasn't impressed with it. It just looked like, it's just like he wanted to adopt something that, like we were talking, has this reputation for being powerful and dangerous, and he just wanted that in there, I think. And so he just adopted it. I don't think there was a lot of real thought or practice put into it, if that makes sense. I just, I, I think it was put there for what it would look like more than anything else. Of course, I yeah, also I have kind of a view of LaVey as kind of a, kind of a con man anyway. <laughs> <You know? laughs> I guess what I would say is that I would agree with you at some level that it was about theatricality. And I would say yeah. also that, that LaVey was first and foremost, like attempting to combine a kind of Epicurean and I mean that in the most positive sense possible, right? Sort of a rationalist, rationalist, he do, he, uh, rationalist atheistic hedonism, mm -hmm. which again, hedonism in the philosophical sense, not do what you want, hurt people, but right. But hedonism in the classical Epicurean sense um, with a kind of theatricality that was transgressive. Um, oh yeah, definitely. And I think that insofar as those kinds of rituals uh, accomplished that he was okay with that because for him I think the art in terms of the theatricality was the four the foremost thing that mattered to him um, and the phil the philosophical stuff was was also very important but it was a it was a combination of theatricality and philosophy and to me yeah. the inclusion of like the embodied in the black mass which right. was just his adaptation of the the Gnostic mass, the Crowley, right. right? You know, so it was it was just kind of like a new kind of Thelema, really. You know, I think it just continued that, and it was also a very psychological model, very based, very based in the psychological model of magic, where it was, right. you know, because because it's atheist, so there is no spiritual world, so it was right. all about how your it affects your mind and how you can use it. Like uh, as I recall, the Satanic Bible gives the example of the. The man who found out that a girl he was going to date was from a fishing village. So he put a mackerel in his pocket before he went on a date with her and then enjoyed the fruits of his of his witchcraft. <laughs> you know? so, and it was just because it, it it was triggering her memories. It was making being around him and smelling that mackerel 
was reminding her of home and therefore he he got with her so yeah it was a very psychological philosophical and yeah it was about pageantry a lot especially with the mass and all that mm -hmm. so yeah that, that and, seemed to be what he was focused on right and, and again to be clear i'm not saying that theatrics is bad most of religion no, no, is, 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 is theatrical <laughs> uh yeah. i'm all about the theatrics of religion trust me i love hardcore Going back to the greek uh the greek play the greek oh. uh what they call those the passion plays i think it was well, or, or before, yeah, I think the, or for me, like just all I'm of the, 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 you know, the, for me, I love the Torah procession and stuff like that. It's pageantry. It's theatrics. Right. I'm all about it because that's psychologically and aesthetically important to us. So don't hear me dismiss the, that aspect of LeVay's work as less than, um, but it is, it, yeah. is it authentic to the D material as Aaron pointed out? No, it's not. And that's where, yeah, I just don't think it's, you know, I mean, like. Maybe it's just because I'm coming at it from that linguistic perspective, yeah. you know, and it's just like he just cut and pasted and changed some words and redefined things and done, you know, and that that's not what I was doing with the language. I was right. trying to crack the language and decipher it and learn what it really was rather than just use it for another purpose. Yeah, I, I yeah, that's to me, that's more interesting. But again, I'm not I have no dog in the fight. You know, if, if uh, religious aesthetics are super important. And if you're, if Enochian uh, uh, em, em, embellishes that, hey, I'm more power to you. Um, so, Graham Pog asks, uh, were the Enochian angels behind uh, Law of One RA2? I'm not quite sure what this is. Uh, that. See, I'm not a Thelemite, so I'm not really up on all, but that sounds like it's some. Lost Aaron for a second. Sorry, folks. Looks like we've lost Aaron for a second. Uh, oh, there he is. Welcome back. Sorry, we lost you there for a second, brother. There we go. Yeah, we both. I think we both crashed out there for a second. I'm not sure. <laughs> that was weird. But uh, so where were we? What what happened? What were we saying? Was, it, we I'll, I'll blame Corona Zone. Um, uh, yes. Yeah. Uh, when in doubt, God blame Corona. Uh, uh, so the grandpa asked, "Were the Enochian angels behind Law of One R A Two? I don't know what this is, so it's it's a little out of my wheelhouse. Yeah, I. I know Crowley did a lot of, you know, because he was, you know, like the vision of the voice. He was trying to work up through the ethers and he was trying to interact with these Anakian entities. Now, from my D purist standpoint, I think he did a lot of stuff wrong, like going the wrong way up through the ethers. And um, the Golden Dawn also misapplied how the calls are supposed to be used, you know. So I've already talked about that, mis mis misusing the system. Um, but I do know that whether misused or not, he was using Anakian magic. Um, I even think Iwas was an angel that he met going up through the ethers and stuff. So there's a lot of Anakian inclusion in what he was doing. So I do think, uh, you know, you, you could make an argument that a lot of the Thelemic philosophy came from Anakian angels, if, if you want to look at it that way. Good. But it, I think it was very specifically Anakian angels, but speaking to Crowley. I mean, it, just like, just like you can look at D's journals and see, like with the Londo versus Madrid thing, right. you can see where D is in there. I mean, these entities are speaking through a human being, so that some of that human being is going to be in there. And right. I think it's it's even it's that to a thousand percent with Crowley. I mean, he was contacting these entities, and he was just getting all of this kind of, you know, uh, it's all it's very Golden Dawnish. I mean, what Crowley knew of magic, he learned from the Golden Dawn, so mm -hmm. it's all very Golden Dawn style. Thelema right. is very, you know, lodge magic uh, style of magic. And so I, just, I think it was all about the filters that he was running. And so all the right. messages, messages are coming through those filters. Whereas yeah, guys like us, we try to get our filters set to D purist so that when the angels speak to us, we're getting, we're hopefully getting <laughs> information through that channel instead. Yeah. I mean, when I, you know, when I, the, 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 you know, when I, I have two gears, right? I have my sympathy gear and my academic gear. Right. And if I turn my uh, sympathy gear, uh, if I turn my academic gear all the way up, then I'm really dismissive. If I turn my, my sympathy gear all the way up, right, it's like Dean and 
Dean and Guvara, or, you know, you know Chesed and Guvara. Uh, when I when I when I when I when I turn my uh, Chesed uh, meter all the way up, I always remember that verse from uh, the Quran where it says, "I have given you an Arabic Quran." When Allah says to Muhammad, "I've given you an Arabic Quran." That always struck me as fascinating because it means that that the Quran we got was a very specific Quran. It was an Arabic Quran for an Arab guy in his setting. But the Quran might be something very different, but he gave him an Arabic Quran. And what is interesting to me is that, you know, again, if these angels are real or whatever, I don't know. But it could be that D got what he got because he was a 16th century English dude. Exactly. They had to give him what he could understand. Exactly. Right. And that's why they were. I and mean, if you read the journals, <clears throat> uh, yeah, we love to focus on all, all the neat magic and ciphers and stuff. But what the angels did most for the most part in the journals was stand there and give sermons. Yeah. Oh, yeah. The world's about and, to end and, and judge this guy and in righteousness and how Jesus yeah. was really the truth. And it was all stuff that D needed to hear from them or he never would have accepted them as angels. So right. they, they'll always come through to us the way we expect them to. Right. Because there's always going to be some of us in that that matrix between us and them. It's never just us or them. You're you're opening yourself up to an intelligence and then it's it's. I, I say it's like telepathy, but they didn't have that word back then. But Agrippa talked about it. You know, they impress messages upon your mind immediately, meaning right. without medium. They don't have to vibrate air. They don't have to write it down. They just put it right into your head like an inspiration. But that means the message you get is not going to be the same by the time your monkey brain translates it into words that you can understand. So we're always going to affect the messages that we get. Mm -hmm. So D, Crowley, me, it doesn't matter. We're always going to, there's always going to be a little of us in there. Mm -hmm. John, I haven't, John's a a dear, uh, dear friend and a a Patreon supporter. So John, appreciate your, your super chat and your question. Um, He asked, what what can you say about the current use of the D work in the Golden Dawn systems and where might they be going in the next couple of years? Definitely a question for you, Aaron. Yeah. um, It's no secret I'm not the hugest fan of Golden Dawn and Akiana, um, but it's not in the sense of having any issue with the system. Like I said before, it's just a different path, and I'm more interested in the D stuff. Um, now being in the golden dawn, working my way up through the inner order grades, I have to take tests on the orders system. So I do know that system and I understand the differences. Um, it's a good question about where it's going. Cause I don't, it's not like there's a big direction that Anakia magic is going in the order. Uh, the, the way it tends to work is you work your way up through the outer order and that's, If you really apply yourself, you can get through that in like two, two and a half years. And it's like taking an associate's degree. And once you've got this associate's degree, you go into the inner order. And what the adepts in the inner order tend to do is they split up. So this adept is really into astrology. So he goes and he writes astrology books like Bob Zoller. And this guy is really into Abramelin. So he goes and he writes Abramelin, you know, about Abramelin or the Grimoires or Anakian. So it's like adepts tend to specialize. So if you're asking me where the order stands right now, I'm pretty much the Anakian guy <laughs> in the in the modern Hermetic order, the Cicero's Hermetic order, the Golden Dawn. So if you're going to base it on me, I'm bringing a lot of the deep purist stuff in. And like I said, I do understand that the Golden Dawn stuff is different in its own thing, but I'm also bringing in like, for example, if, if I'm in the temple doing a ritual, I you will never hear me use what we call Golden Dawn liturgical Anakian. I always pronounce the language the way D would have pronounced it. So, like, whereas the order would say, O-L, Sonu, Veo, Arsurgi, Gohu, Ayade, Balelta, I would say, O, Sonvorj, Gohu, Yadabalt. So, I... The, 
I am. I think I'm having an effect on the order by bringing in a lot of this deep purist stuff, but I'm not changing anything. You know, I don't. I'm not trying to replace the reform table of Raphael, which is what the order uses, with the original great table, which is what the deep purist system uses. You know, I'm, I'm keeping them separate. So I, you know, I don't. I don't think there's any massive direction that the order is trying to take right now for Anaki and Magic. They've kind of got their own directions they're trying to go, which has a lot more to do with making sure the order is large enough and stable enough to survive for the next several generations. Um, and I guess uh, beyond that, I don't have much to say about the order system. Uh, like I said, I'm not the greatest fan of it. I could pick it apart here and there on some things that I dislike about it. Um, but yeah, I just, I just see it as its own thing. And when I have to take tests on it, I study it and I pass those tests. And but then I just go on back to doing my own thing, <laughs> which is more deep purist. So that's where that kind of stands. Aaron, what do you think is the, 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 what do you think is the, the final oomph of the Enochian system? Like, what do you get? What, 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 what is, if you do the whole thing, if you really bring the whole thing home, what's the, what's the promise of it? Hmm. See, that's kind of a good question because as you pointed out in your, in, in your recent video, the, the, the true purpose of the system was international espionage and geopolitics, you know? <laughs> So, I mean, strictly speaking, if you're going to go through the trouble of, you know, putting these tools together and, and doing it right and making contact with these angels, that is the system you're studying. You are studying a system that will let you influence, you know, massive events in the world in as far as the angels will allow you to in influence those events. Um, but then there's the whole aspect, of, like I revealed in the first volume of my work, is that D was very much trying to create a Christian Kabbalah. Uh, the angelical language was his attempt to create the sacred language of the West. You know, if or, if you were Jewish, you had Hebrew. If you were Arab, if you were a Muslim, you had Arabic. If you know, and, and Christians didn't have their own sacred language. You know, you you know, you had uh, Greek and Latin, but that was also for academics and, and stuff like that. So he wanted to, to, to offer these things and create this whole new current. And I think that's important. I think that's kind of the promise there, you know, the, the Jebba fall ceremony, which is his version of the 50 gates of wisdom. You know, the idea is to climb the heavens, learn about the universe, meet and build relationships with the angels and ultimately learn their mysteries. Um, D even said that several times he had, mm -hmm given his day and time he had studied everything man had to teach at least western man he should have gone down into africa and learned some stuff from the tribes down there but he didn't do that so he learned everything he could from western sources and that's what he wanted was more knowledge more wisdom yeah. radical like truths enoch. yeah just like enoch himself yeah. had done uh enoch had gone up uh you know you you mentioned uh that that Gabriel or Jibril had told Muhammad, I have given you an Arabic Quran, but it's not the Quran. Mm -hmm. And, you know, another Quran was given to Moses and a different Quran was given to Jesus. And, 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 and it all really goes back to um, what Enoch did, where he was taken up by the angels into the heavens and he was shown what they call the tablets of destiny. Yeah. which is it's written on fire with fire and it contains every word God has ever spoken or ever will speak. And it contains every mystery and every piece of knowledge and information in the entire universe from beginning to end. And he copied Enoch was allowed to copy as much as he could out of those divine tablets, but he couldn't even, he couldn't even scratch the surface. He couldn't even come close. And he was able to he was able to copy 366 volumes of information from there and never even scratch the surface. And he brought those back and those became a holy text, which was supposedly then lost in the flood and then supposedly redelivered to Dean Kelly in the form of Liber Loga. So what we're really looking at, the very heart of the system is Loga. And it is an earthly, if very limited and incomplete, uh, uh, edition of the celestial tablets. It's the same thing as 
the law being given to Moses, the Quran being given to to uh, uh, to Muhammad. It's 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 uh, these are all earthly reflections of the divine law. And in each case, we're we are to understand that these are imperfect, that this was written by a human who was doing his best to write down these wonderful celestial truths that he, he's discovered. And each one of them, whether it's the Torah, the New Testament, the Quran, Libra Loga itself, all of these, um, they're all just limited and flawed. So our goal by engaging in Jebofal is to get into the gates of heaven and read the tablets for ourselves, mm. not the 49 by 49 grids, but the celestial ones the infinite ones uh that's basically what Nalvage was standing on it was infinite letters in all directions that was those were the celestial talents right. yeah so, so that yeah, is but... really the heart of it you know that christian kabbalah that ascension through the gates um that learning of the divine secrets uh what the golden dawn called becoming more than human you know to walk with angels to have that holy invisible companionship um that's the real thrust of it. Mm. You know, like, kind of like I said before, standing above the thousand other monkeys that are pestering them for drugs and sex <laughs> and rock and roll, and you actually impress them and they want to teach you. And that's that's what we shoot for. That's what we're really shooting for. It's knowledge. Yeah, yeah. Libra Logo, knowledge right? Is, yep, knowledge but, is yeah. power. And once you have the knowledge, you know, just like just like uh, King Solomon, what's your one wish? Wisdom. Right. Because everything else, if I want to be rich, wisdom will get me there. If I want women, wisdom will get them. If I want, no matter what else you want in the world, wisdom is what you have to start with. And that's why we go up through the 50 gates of wisdom. Right. The Libra Loga. Loga means. Yeah. Wisdom Loga, the speech from God. Yeah. Which is, speech from God. You know. Yeah. Um, so I guess the last question I'll ask um, in terms of, uh, uh, and I'll, Oh, let's draw this out. So it's on a super chat. Why am I drawn to making faces out of grown or found materials? This is a super chat that's not terribly terribly. <laughs> what do they rated. call that where you see faces and everything? It's uh, Pareidolia. Pareidolia, yes. Yeah. I think that's an important part of our ability to do magic. Yeah. We it's not just seeing faces, it's actually recognizing many, personality. Many personality and intelligence in what would what science would consider inanimate things right. so yeah i think that's a big part of how we humans operate and how we interface with the universe yeah. our environment aaron where do you want to see where would you like to see academic study of enochiana go where would you if, if you had a team of academics, academics, just academics. I can always, I, I can just speak for myself. If you had a team of, you know, five or 10 people, um, linguists, philosophers, theologians, blah, 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 where would you want to see them go in terms of, in terms of forwarding the practice of the spirituality uh, of Enochiana? Mm -hmm. where, where, because, um academics love to judge practitioners which i think is garbage right um i think I, I i really hate that and i apologize when academics do that stuff um and also i'll say this publicly aaron other occultists if you see esoterica again i'm ribbing things trust me i rib my own religion like but if you see if you see me cross the line let me know and I mean that. And I think I said that to you privately. Um, but at the same time, I think it's important because as an academic, I rely on what you guys do. I rely on practitioners. And so I'm really interested to think about how we can, how academics and occultists can serve each other's respective communities. And so what I want to ask is, where do you think academics can plug into um, forwarding Enochiana? Hmm. Well, when you're you're specifically asking about academics, 
So I think this just goes back to what we already spoke about, where why I think the academic side is so important to the practical side, you know, um, for us to be able to put into good practice uh, this tradition and this system. Or a, a great example is the, the grimoires. Uh, we know things about the grimoires and, and the tradition, the, 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 the pan-European Western occult tradition that was going on at the time. We know so much more about that now than we did just 20 years ago. Mm-hmm. And we know infinitely more about it now than we did when Mathers and Crowley and Waite were writing about those grimoires. Yeah, it, that, that blows. People need to understand this. There are 150 manuscripts of the Key of Solomon. Alone. Alone. <laughs> Not to mention the thousands of other grimoires yeah. and, and cunning books and stuff yeah. from that era that are out there. And like if you uh, only you use a manuscript that wasn't even in English yet, and that's another oh, yeah. big problem. Things that aren't even, haven't even been translated yet. Yeah. But... Like I back into it, I tell people like if you think that the one manuscript you have that you got on like Barnes and Noble is the only one, trust me, mm-hmm. that is not the case. That's There's even a, a later one. That's lands yeah. down. Was it twelve oh eight or five? But yeah. it's one of the later ones, and it's it's not all that great. And of course, Mathers made a lot of changes to it because he thought he knew better. Um, so yeah, there's there's that, and that's I'm repeating myself, but that's what's so important. We without the academic side of it, we wouldn't know what we know today to practice the way we do. And and, and from a, from a practical side, I'll tell you how this works. The spirits are very forgiving. Okay. So I can spend years doing this one thing, whatever it is, ABC, in my practice. And my, my, the angels I'm working with seem fine with it. But then we learned that I was wrong. We learned that that's not the way it was actually done. This was a misinterpretation. This was something that needs, you know. And then if I continue doing it the wrong way, then the spirits start getting miffed with me. They start pestering me about it because now I know what's wrong and they want me to do it right. And, and if, if, if it's a figure on a talisman and I'm like, well, you know, I'm not going to remake that talisman. It's fine. Every time I pick up that talisman, they'll nag at me. That symbol's wrong. That symbol's wrong. That symbol's wrong until I remake the talisman. And this, this has happened to me a thousand times in my practice. So we depend so much on the academic side because we're correcting things. We're, we're, we are resurrecting an otherwise dead tradition here. You know, we're resurrecting it, reconstructing it, and we can't do that without the academics. So that, it's so important. Um, I don't know how much more academically we have to go on the Anakian system. I do want to see historians continue to investigate Dee's life. There's a lot of stuff in there that surprised even me, like when I found out he was working with the Catholics for a mm-hmm. while helping to prosecute Protestants. But then Queen Elizabeth gets back in power and she just accepts them with open arms and nary a word about him working for the bad guys. I mean, there's so much cloak and daggery. Like you're saying, I mean, you, you, you say that the buried treasure thing was like a D and D quest. The, the entirety of the journals is like a James Bond flick, you know? Yeah, it's and true. it's just, there's, and there's so much history there. And I want to see the academics continue to unlock that history. Mm. Cause every time they do, we learn something else that makes something in the journals make more sense. Right. You know, if you've never heard of the family of love, then the wife swapping incident makes no sense. Right. But if you've heard of the family of love and you've heard that D may have actually had friends in that movement, then you start to see where that whole wife swap thing might have been a lot bigger and a lot more meaningful than the dismissive attitude people give it today. Well, yeah. they couldn't have been angels, you know. Angels, they only talk about war and killing and all that stuff. I mean, angels would never suggest that humans, you know, love each other. That's no, that's that's a bridge too far. So yeah, it's the academic side is important. And then I will say one last thing. There is one thing I want you academics to do. And that is finally crack and decipher Loga. <laughs> I, 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 as much as I, as you know, I'm a practitioner, very dedicated to the very Gnostic concept of Loga, that we're not really supposed to know what it says. We're just supposed to summon the angels and let them tell us what it says and let, let them teach us. And the idea that what the angel tells you is in the text will be different than what an angel will tell me is in the text. I think that's the point. And I think we're all supposed to have our own gnosis 
through this system. But I can't get Trithemius out of my head and how a very famous angelic grimoire turned out to be a bunch of military secrets. And if anybody was using an angelic journal to hide a bunch of military secrets, it was probably D. So I would really finally, I would really love to have us finally crack the cipher on how the keys work, how the titles of the pages of Logar work, and how that weird call zero. Yeah, call zero. Because I think all of those together are supposed to decipher Loga, and it's going to take quantum computers to probably figure out how the hell that all was supposed to work. And I hope I live to see it because that's going to be fascinating when we find out what was really in there. In there. I, yeah. I mean, yeah, we need another, uh, uh, yeah. I, I am skeptical that we'll ever crack Libra Loga. I mean, having seen the, I am too. I having am seen too. it mathematically, like, you know, having like, you know, didn't seen the mathematical analysis of it or done a couple of mathematical analysis of it. I'm skeptical, but uh, also I don't yeah. want to because I don't know. It's not for uh, it's for the Messiah. Because then it'll kill the mystery. And and like I said, that Gnostic aspect where you're yeah. not supposed to know. And I think I really honestly, I as much as I'm willing to, if it's ever cracked and we find out it was military secrets, I'm not the kind of practitioner that's going to nay say that and say that's BS. I accept new information as it comes in. Yeah. But I, folks, I I think and I hope that it never will be deciphered. Yeah, I don't know that it will. But you know, we cracked Soiga. Like we now know what Soga was. That's like, right. We, Thanks we, to Jim Reeds. Yeah, Jim Reeds. We cracked Soiga. We uh Trithemius, his big cipher got cracked. It got cracked. Uh, I can't name the guy who did that one, but um yeah. and just recently the 340 cipher by the Zodiac Killer was cracked. Uh, did they which, finally crack that they cracked it yeah the okay. 340 cipher was cracked um okay. i if you if you love cryptography uh aaron if you love cryptography go look up the uh, uh the fbi has verified that the solution is right um uh, yeah we, we cracked the 340 so when i say we like smart people like people who want to care about these things so right God willing, you know, um, been looking, man. never stop looking and trying no. to decipher. No, I agree. Um, and also, I, I really appreciate the fact that you said that if you if the if Libra Logi is cracked and it turns out to be military secrets, you'll 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 accept that. Like, yeah, it doesn't it doesn't, it doesn't change the magical system, you know? <laughs> yeah. And so, like, I really appreciate the fact that, you know, it doesn't have to be secrets from interdimensional beings or whatever uh or alchemical secrets or you know i hope if i cracked yeah, it, it's I, great. I didn't dismiss trothemius once i learned that you know those were all secret messages actually i think it was kind of ingenious oh and, yeah and the magical rituals he gives in there are still good yeah they still work you know so and i just hope that if i ever uh, well i'll say well this uh if i hope i ever crack it that it's a uh, very treasure and i get it first I'll share some with you. There you go. Uh, <laughs> I must say, yeah, share some with me. Yeah. <laughs> um, all right, folks. Uh, there's a lot of you in the chat and, and watching around. We have 380 people watching. Um, wow. So it's it's a, a good crowd. So I just want to say um, two things uh, or three things. First thing, Aaron, thank you. Thank you for coming on. Thank you for chatting with me. Um Again, this is just such a great opportunity to 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 be a case where an academic and a practitioner scholar, and I, I again I keep saying practitioner scholar because Aaron, you're not just a practitioner; you're a practitioner scholar. You have done heavy lifting on the scholarship side, and whether you're an academic or not, I want to honor your work of scholarship by calling it authentic scholarship because I don't want to say. <laughs> like i i don't like the idea of this practitioner academic divide uh, and so yeah, the fact that it there. wasn't the fact that your work wasn't published through a uh an academic journal does not make it amazing scholarship and i will say as an academic i rely on it and i honor it as a scholarship so thank you for it um so that's the first thing i want to say first and foremost because i think that uh often occultists uh Occult occultists who do scholarship often have academics look down have, have academics look down their nose at them, and I I and I I want to refuse that 
and I want to reject that, and I want to honor uh, my occultist scholars who do that work. So first of all, thank you for your scholarship. Um, second of all, I want to say, <laughs> yeah, thank you. Thank you. I really mean that. Uh, second of all, folks, I just want to thank everyone in the who's watching and in the chat. Thank you guys. Thank you guys for coming out to support Esoterica. Thank you guys for supporting Aaron. Go to Aaron's website, buy his books, go to Doc Solomon's. You can buy his books autographed. You can support him directly. Support this man. This is a guy who's done, I'm telling you, thousands of hours, tens of thousands of hours of work to to support the occult community out of a labor of love. You can get his books directly. Give him the best cut of your money you can because he deserves it. And so you get an autographed copy, you get a signed copy. Trust me, like do that. Like support your people, support your people. If you pirate the copy on eBay or, or on whatever, Libgen, whatever. But if you can give this man some money to support his work, his family, support him. That's the second thing. Third thing, Friday, we have another Esoterica live stream. Coming out with me, right? Coming out with me at Esoterica. I'll be doing some uh, some Q and A and stuff Friday afternoon, so you can grab me Friday if you want to have uh, direct conversation with me and ask me questions as well. Um, one more live, one more live chat. Uh, so I don't want to leave anyone out. Anyone who gives money to the channel, I want to leave them out. But no more, please don't send any more. So I don't want anyone to. Uh, <laughs> I don't want anyone to pay something and not get their question answered. So, whoops. Uh, sorry. So can talisman creation be a result of inter extraterrestrial interaction or an outlet to recreate a moment? It feels like a form of channeling. Why? Hmm. I think a lot of that would depend on where <coughs> you're coming from, I think. Like what system you're using, what tradition you're using. Because um, like making talismans in the Golden Dawn is a little different than making talismans in, say, the Solomonic system. Um, so, uh, like for instance, in the Solomonic system, which is how I make talismans, uh, you know, there's a, we, we start with an astrological election and then we form the talisman at that election time. And that is where, um, its virtues are actually set into the physical object. Basically that talisman has a birth chart, just like you do. Um, after that it's consecrated and then once it is consecrated, it can then be used. And that, that that's the only place I can think of where you might feel it's channeling because I'll actually tell my clients if I make a talisman for them, you don't you don't just wear it or carry it around or or set it on a shelf. You have to hold it and meditate with it and maybe pray to the entities linked to it and ask how to use it. So there's the channeling aspect of it. Um, I don't really get into the extraterrestrial thing. Uh, you know, like I mentioned before, that there are people that think that the Enochian entities are aliens. Uh, but if you look in the journals, it was actually Michael, Raphael, Gabriel, and Uriel that were in charge of the whole, uh, of all the scrying sessions. And they are the ones that brought and introduced the other angels. So I can't really hold to them being aliens. Um, you could call them extraterrestrial because they're celestial. I mean, they they don't live on Earth, so I guess they are <laughs> extraterrestrial. Or you could call Fair them enough. interdimensional. <laughs> because they are spiritual beings, so they don't live in our dimension. Um, but, you know, most people are using those terms to mean more of a science fiction kind of thing or a real world kind of thing, like aliens visiting and helping build the pyramids and stuff. And I just, I don't get into that at all. I don't, I don't find that very academic. I don't think it's reflected by history. Um, I find it a little imperialist, in fact, a little... You know, oh, those brown people couldn't possibly have built those pyramids. It must have been white people who came down from space to. I just, I don't, I don't see that. I don't see why the Egyptians couldn't have built the pyramids. Why the, you know? So I just, I, I don't really study the the ancient alien stuff. I just, I don't. It doesn't affect. It's, it's not part of my tradition at all. So, yeah, yeah, I agree with you, Aaron. I think, uh, I think that every time I hear like Atlantis Aryans extraterrestrial white people built pyramids yeah. i'm like 
Oh yeah, but, we're but back to the really looking at that all is just like I said, you could call them at you know extra dimensional or whatever because you're dealing with spiritual entities. You're dealing with an intelligence from outside yourself. Mm-hmm. And it is a lot like channeling, you know, you've you've made this physical object that is the embodiment of this spiritual force or a particular spirit, if it's a talisman for Michael or Gabriel or Beelzebub or whoever you're making a talisman for. And then, yeah, it's you, it's like a telephone line. That is what, that's your focal point if you're going to communicate with the entity. So there's the channeling and the entity will tell you how to use that talisman, not just set it aside and hope it does its job like a little battery. You actually have to employ it and the, the entity will tell you how. So it's all about communication. So at least that that I agree with. It is about communication. Yeah, thank you, Aaron, for filling the question. Um, okay, folks. Well, um, again, I have a live stream on Friday as a Cherica live stream. Um, Aaron. Be there. <laughs> yeah, like uh, we'll talk about whatever. Uh, Aaron, thank you so much for coming on and sharing your uh, your experience, your wisdom, your insight. And uh, thank you. Yeah, I mean, oh. this has been such an honor to be here. I, I had a blast. I hope we do this again. Yeah, God willing, brother Hashem, uh, with God's help, we will. And uh, I just want to say, folks, uh, again, uh, thank you guys. Thank everyone who comes and hangs out with us, who talks with us, who hangs out in the chat, ask questions. Um, this channel is nothing without you guys. Like, I mean, Esoterica is just me making content. And I just want to say that I'm honored to, you know, facilitate conversations. Again, you know, Aaron and I, we, we, in the weeds, we probably disagree about a lot of things. Like we have different spiritual traditions. We have different like ways of interpreting the, the D stuff. We have a lot of different things, but the great thing is we can reach across the ether and, and communicate in a brotherly way that's respectful and honorable even though we may disagree, even though we may have differences of opinion or approach, like as a practitioner or non-practitioner, we can actually express that we respect each other, we can honor each other, and we can yeah. build a world in which all of us are respected, all of us are held in, in, in a position of holiness. And I just want to say, Aaron, thank you for you know sitting down with an academic who may not share your opinions. Um, and I, I appreciate everyone who's in the chat who says, Hey, look, uh, maybe you people in the chat may hate both of us. <laughs> I have no idea. You know, I'm looking at some of the chat and they may hate both of us. I have no idea, but here at Esoterica are my job, right? The job that I've chosen for myself is to facilitate conversations and analysis that is reasonable, respectful, in honoring of the traditions of Western esotericism. And if I can do that, I've done the best. Uh, and if I failed, I'm sure I will, uh, then I hope you'll forgive me. But I want to thank everyone who's come out to talk to us for, uh, yeah, for respecting us as much as you have in the chat, which hasn't always been true. And um, I also want to, again, thank Aaron uh, for joining us and uh, Bezer Hashem with God's help. Uh, you'll, you'll come back and hang out with me. Awesome. I can't wait. Anytime. Yeah. Wonderful. So everybody, thank you so much. Uh, I'll hopefully see folks Friday afternoon. Uh, let's come hang out Friday afternoon and, um, and uh, chat about esoterica and recent episodes and maybe some uh, recent scholars and Aaron, if you're available Friday afternoon, you can jump in and we can do some, you know, a little panel or something. But uh, at any rate, I just want to thank everybody who's, uh, who's taken the time to, to join us. And uh, I want to say to everyone, uh, have a great night um, and sleep well. I hope you have good dreams. Um, if it's already really late for you, I hope you wake up early in peace. But otherwise than that, uh, again, many thanks. And uh, Zorg. Zorg. <laughs> yeah. <laughs>